Our final speaker, last and certainly not least, is uh, Carolyn Bartholomew, who is the chair of the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission. They are looking at the issue of smart cities, uh, development and deployment, and since they are among the, the consumers of the insights we produce today, we ask that they join us. So, Carolyn, over to you. Thank you very much. Is everybody here okay? Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Uh, some of you, many of you might not ever have heard of us. We were established uh, by the U.S. Congress when Congress essentially voted to pave the way uh, into, uh, for China's entry into the WTO. There were many lingering concerns about the national security implications of the U.S.-China economic relationship. Uh, we are tasked every year with doing an annual report to Congress that you can find at uscc.gov. It covers a broad range of economic and security issues, and we also have a Cliff Notes version of it so that uh, we always say you can use this one at night to put yourself to sleep, and then this is the one that... that so what we do is we, we have hearings throughout the year. We do research. We have a terrific staff. We have one of our staff members in here. And we um, provide recommendations to Congress. I'm very pleased that, that Dr. Harry mentioned sort of nation states, uh, because really that's what I'm going to focus on today. And I'm, I want to talk about, think about the national security risks um, inherent in uh, China's participation in, in all of these activities. They are a major producer of the equipment that goes in, they are promoting their own, uh, their own products and services, and they are moving globally to enter into this space. And what does that mean for us? Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the legitimate desires of state and local governments um, to use technology. People have talked about that earlier today, uh, technology that we now generally call smart cities to increase efficiency and reduce costs. It's laudable, of course, that they're trying to manage traffic flow better that they're trying to improve utility services like electricity and water, and to coordinate emergency services. We can't expect them to put national security first and foremost as they make what they see as local decisions. But what about a community that is adjacent to a military installation, for example? Where is the responsibility there to think about that national security implications? Many, in addition, many if not most state and local leaders have mandates to choose the lowest cost bidder for goods and services that they're procuring. Chinese tech companies, which are backed by the Chinese government through an array of subsidies, the deep pockets of the Chinese government, and other forms of government assistance can easily be the lowest bidder, often coming in with bids that are up to 30% lower than non-Chinese companies. The rollout of 5G and the expansion and marketing of smart cities, which need 5G, have brought many questions to the fore. And I think one of the major themes we need to be thinking about is how do we balance all of these competing interests. The issues are complicated, as you've heard, and we all really need to be engaging in an ongoing conversation with mayors and governors to make sure that there's informed decision making. China's smart cities urbanization is at the center of its economic and technology policy agenda. This involves a whole of government push encompassing resources and bureaucratic coordination that's not imaginable in the US context. China is already a global leader in many areas of the technology involved, including AI applications like facial recognition. Smart city technologies are becoming a critical element in China's export basket and more broadly in its commercial diplomacy. This poses a national security risk to the United States and a strategic and ethical threat to liberal democratic governance everywhere. Some examples of Chinese exports of smart city technology, Huawei, which you read about in the papers on almost a daily basis now, is successfully exporting smart city and public services cloud platforms, such as the Rhine Cloud, it is implementing in Duisburg, Germany. According to a Huawei press release announcing the Rhine Cloud, Huawei's smart city solutions are serving over 120 cities in more than 40 countries around the globe. Smaller companies like SenseTime, a Chinese facial recognition software provider, have exported surveillance technology already to markets in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. China is actively trying to build export markets for smart city applications of IC technologies along its Belt and Road. I'm, many of you, I hope you know a little bit about the Belt and Road Initiative. There's a couple of wonderful maps out there that map sort of the infrastructure railroads, hard infrastructure 
infrastructure, railroads, ports, and things like that, we looked to see if there was any sort of map that was mapping the digital Silk Road that's going on and have, have not yet found it. But they're doing deals around the world. Um, the China Chamber of Commerce for Import and Export of Machinery and Electronic Products, which is an ostensibly non-governmental industrial association comprised of nearly 10,000 companies, has been actively promoting its members' exports at all of the BRA, BRI conferences. The implications of China exporting IoT sensors and critical infrastructure are significant, significant both economic and strategically. Economically, of course, there's a risk that China will dominate global market share in industries for which U.S. firms have historically been competitive, even without catching up to the technological superiority of the U.S. From a security standpoint, Chinese firms may be able to exploit vulnerabilities in IoT technology and some of the, odes that, the, the, the nodes that Dr. Harry talked about incorporated in other countries' smart cities as it could with the United States. Zimbabwe is using China's CloudWalk AI platform in its own surveillance efforts. Aside from enabling surveillance technology for repressive uses, this arrangement allows Chinese firms to build a more robust data set for training AI and facial recognition with non-Chinese faces. I'm going to say here, I don't know if any of you have done Ancestry.com or a 23andMe, but every time you end up putting your, your information in there to learn about your background, that information is in a database that can be exploited. Malaysian police are now using smart glasses equipped with facial recognition from cam cameras from China. And the Gulf countries are also reportedly turning to China, not just for arms that the US has denied them like drones, but for surveillance technology as well. China's smart cities urbanization is at the center of its economic and technology policy agenda. China's drive to build smart cities is a whole of government push encompassing bureaucratic resources. Elements of China's smart city plans are among Xi Jinping's signature initiatives. So far, the initiatives that Xi has put his name on always move forward quickly, no matter what the costs. These include his endorsement of the development of the futuristic smart city outside of Beijing that is effectively being built from scratch and used to pilot infrastructure ex in experiments like roads that use only autonomous vehicles. Smart city infrastructure is at the heart of the digital Silk Road. One example is that Huawei has signed a deal with Monaco to deploy smart city technology, and they signed that deal just this past February. China has a Made in China 2025 initiative, which is intending to make China essentially independent in the, in the development and production of, of uh, key things. Its smart city technology relies on information and communication technology that is highlighted in Xi's signature industrial plan. The Chinese Communist Party documentation has been quite clear on its ultimate vision, a hyper-connected society where individual behavior is guided by extreme surveillance and a series of sticks and carrots. According to a researcher at Australia Strategic Policy Institute, this vision actually predates China's modern reform era and builds on the party's Leninist roots and its obsession with preserving power. It uses technology to extend what they call the mass line, a concept introduced by Chairman Mao to incorporate feedback from the general populace and integrate that feedback into policy within a Marxist-Leninist framework. In application, the mass line, now revived by Xi Jinping, encouraged society to monitor, its, monitor itself and report counter-revolutionary activity to cadres. Smart city technology would make the vast network of sensors and connected individuals complicit in social monitoring and enforcement. For instance, in China, there's a deadbeat debtors map, an app that's already in the trial stages in Hefei, Anhui province, which shows users the location of people who are in debt around them. This is not a trial, but the system it would support is. Uh, excuse me, I think I have that backwards. It is a trial, but the system it would support is not. The system would have various tiers of dishonesty for various crimes. Offenders may be prohibited from accessing social services. For instance, they only may be allowed to purchase second-class city uh, train tickets or patronize lower-tiered hospitals. 
a central goal of China's social management is to identify and contain political unrest as quickly as possible. The current social credit system builds on discussion of technology-enabled social trust platforms that date from the 1980s and the 90s. In these platforms, an administrator would monitor blocks of neighboring families collecting information on possible, possible political subversion to preempt any instability. This goes hand in hand with a system that would improve public service provision, reduce traffic congestion, and generally enhance public welfare. The difficult dynamic is that the social control aspects are intertwined with the benign aspects, and it will be easy for China to showcase the latter in touting the superiority of its model. China's smart cities urbanization, as I've said, is at the center of its economic and technology uh, uh, policy agenda. The key enabling technologies, many of which I think you've heard about today, surveillance equipment, Internet of Things sensors, 5G, artificial intelligence. I want to just briefly uh, talk about the scale of China's investment in these te uh, technologies, which overlap. On AI, China has announced intentions to be the world leader in AI by 2030 forecasting a $1 trillion industry. CNBC reports that $4.5 billion was invested in more than 200 Chinese AI companies between 2012 and 2017. On the Internet of Things, China already has the, the world's largest market for IoT, accounting for 22% of the global total. Through Made in China 2025 and its Internet Plus plan, numerous com companies are being subsidized to improve connectivity in a range of applications, including those core to smart cities, uh, smart cities, such as transportation and various other public services. On 5G, according to a report released by De uh, Deloitte last August, since 2015, China has built 350,000 new 5G sites, compared to 30,000 constructed by the United States, and has outspent the United States on 5G by about $24 billion. A little bit about some of the key Chinese companies. Bloomberg's roundup of 22 high-profile companies in its survey of the companies behind China's high-tech surveillance state divides the companies into the big brother billionaires like Hike Vision and Dahua Technologies, the tech giants, including Alibaba and Tencent, and other surveillance players such as Sense Time, which I've mentioned, and iFlight, which tend to be smaller and focused on a single industry. Notably, these companies include mostly what some like to call private companies. Here, I'm going to say that my commission um, is very skeptical of the concept of private companies as we understand them in China. They don't really exist as, as we see what a private company is. The government can mandate the presence of party cells in these companies. It can control board members, and it uses the subsidies and advantages it provides to these companies including erecting barriers to Chinese markets for foreign companies. And they use all of those things as leverage on the companies. When people raise questions about would Huawei really do what the Chinese government expects it, expects it to do, I think the answer when you look at this basket of things is yes, I don't think you can expect otherwise. We don't have these concerns, notably, about other countries' telecom companies like Nokia or Ericsson. And we do have them about China's telecoms. Two major trends in Chinese advanced technology are censorship and the linking of AI capabilities. For instance, in facial recognition and other forms of pattern recognition with high-performing surveillance hardware. Much of this technology is already being deployed by China's extensive public security apparatus. US institutions have become partners in China's technology of the surveillance state, sometimes wittingly, sometimes unwittingly. And companies, according to a, a video surveillance information service called IPVM, Hike Vision and Dahua have extensive supplier relationships with large American tech firms, chiefly Intel, NVIDIA, Seagate, and Western Digital. You may be familiar with Hike Vision because of the Wall Street Journal's reporting last year on Hike Vision cameras being used at a military base in Missouri and at the US Embassy in Kabul. Once the story broke, the cameras were pulled and newer risk restrictions were put in place for US procurement. The Wall Street Journal also reported that Qualcomm chips are used in Chinese surveillance equipment, and Qualcomm owns a stake in SenseTime. 
In February, the New York Times reported that Thermo Fisher products were being used in Xinjiang to help build a database of Uyghur's DNA. And reporting by Wired last November revealed how Remark Holdings, a debt-laden website operator, was trying to revive itself by peddling surveillance equipment in China. At universities, US research, sometimes funded by defense agencies, is being taken up by Chinese companies and research organizations. In some cases, it's because of the transparency of the US system. In some cases, it is because follow-up projects find funding more easily in China. And in some cases, it is through active efforts, efforts active attempts to acquire the results of research conducted in the United States. There is a debate going on in our many of our uh, academic institutions about what to do uh, with, with the Chinese presence, what to do with uh, cooperation and partnerships. Last June, the Wall Street Journal detailed in an article called How a Powerful Spy Camera Invented at Duke Ended Up in China's Hands when the professor who developed the camera with funding from DARPA moved to China because no further funding was provided by the Pentagon. Since time, mentioned above, has partnered with MIT in launching a lab for AI. Since time has also sold facial recognition technology to 40 sub public security bureaus in China, and approximately one third of its revenue comes from facial recognition technology, according to reporting by NPR last April. Just two days ago, a story broke about Microsoft's work with a Chinese university that's run by the military in the development of AI technology intended for use in surveillance and censorship. US companies are helping to market an image of Chinese smart cities as a utopian future without addressing the ethical questions raised by China's repressive use of technology. They do so in the process of trying to attract capital to investment in China's smart cities development and sell know-how on how doing business with Chinese companies and government entities involved in building China's smart cities. For instance, a 2018 Deloitte publication entitled Super Smart City, Happier Society with Higher Quality features a lengthy section on China that includes a picture of Xi Jinping and a quote from the 19th Party Congress, the quote, the smart city emphasizes the promotion of people-centered, sustainable innovation based on new network facilities, new data environment, new ideas and models, and new technology application with an aim to offer the people a greater sense of fulfillment and happiness. For the past five years, PricewaterhouseCooper has partnered with the Development Research Center, a think tank under China's State Council, to publish a series of annual reports entitled China's Cities of Opportunity. The most recent includes an opening section on studying the spirit of the 19th CPC National Congress and integrating urban development strategy into business operation. In essence, framing the CCP's agenda as a business opportunity. And a recent New York Times expose on McKinsey, how McKinsey has helped raise the stature of authoritarian governments published last December, detailed a range of operations for which the management consulting firm has helped advance Chinese government strategic interests, including helping nine of the top 20 firms involved in the Belt and Road Initiative. On smart cities, a McKinsey report issued last year notes that police patrols cannot be everywhere, for instance, but predictive ana analytics can deploy them in the right place at the right time. There are a number of different challenges to national security posed by smart cities and the infrastructure on which they will rely. Let's start with the surveillance state. Smart cities rely on networked platforms, sensors, cameras, telecom and wireless equipment, data analytics and cloud computing, and electronics and software. This equipment can be used to access devices that are part of the Internet of Things, our smartphones, our computers, virtual assistants like Alexa and Siri, Fitbits, and yes, even possibly, though people always laugh about this, our refrigerators and our microwaves. With AI and facial recognition, they can track who is walking where. They can ID cars, license plates, and passengers, people in airports, bus stations, and railway terminals. What the Chinese government is doing to the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province is a chilling example of China's Orwellian application of advanced technology and the use of information collected by that technology to repress an entire population. 
more than a million Uyghurs have reportedly been detained and are being held in camps. An unknown number have disappeared, and some are suspected of having been killed. In addition to more low-tech low tech tactics, like going into schools and asking young children if their parents pray, the Chinese government is employing what could be considered elements of smart city technology. The surveillance equipment being employed in Uyghur cities includes CCTV cameras with facial recognition and infrared for night vision, and Wi-Fi sniffers, which ID addresses of computers and smartphones to help track the contacts between and the movements of people. In mid-February, Victor Gievers, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, he's a Dutch cybersecurity research, discovered a database tracking at least 2.5 million residents of Xinjiang province on a 24-hour basis using facial recognition, crowd analysis, and personal veri verification. The database, which included individuals' GPS location with information on the name, sex, ethnicity, ID number, birth date, home address, and employer, had been left unsecured on the internet for seven months, during which at least one malefactor had raided it. It was created by SenseNet's technology, a Shenzhen-based surveillance technology company, whose parent company received strategic funding from Intel Capital in 2010. SenseNet is different from SenseTime, which is a Chinese AI unicorn partnering with MIT to conduct leading AI research. However, SenseTime, in fact, owned a 49% stake in SenseNet right up until the unsecured people tra tracking database was discovered, after which it divested which out without disclosing its regions. Which leads to another national security concern as we look at smart cities technology, the collection and retention of massive amounts of data. What happens to that data? How will it, how can it be used? Smart cities will require the coordination of information from multiple arenas and across multiple locations. Chinese 5G equipment and connected products could gain access to the private data of billions of people, such as medical services, gaming, social media, location, banking information, and more. And access to this information could be used in any number of ways, including targeting. Already, for those of us who were part of the OPM hack, we know the, the risks there. Combine that information with information gained on the Anthem hack, and it raises some pretty chilling possibilities. Imagine being able to combine what information they've learned with what you went to the doctor for, what you post on social media, what games you play, what movies you watch, what people you follow, and your bank account balances and spending patterns. We aren't really that far moved from, removed from such possibilities. Concerns about the use of data collected are not limited to Chinese use of the data. There are very real concerns that even in liberal democracies, some would and will use information collected to try to silence dissent and undermine the opposition. There have been a number of examples of redirection of internet uh, data and exfil uh, inter of internet, uh, excuse me, examples of redirection of the internet and exfiltration of data from Chinese telecom equipment. Here are just a few. Research by Chris Demchak and Yuval Shavit identified instances where internet traffic had been redirected from North America into China in 2016 and 2017. China Telecom had 10 internet's points of presence across the internet backbone of North America, eight of which are in the US, two in Canada. Redirected data to China disappears into a black box and then comes back out the other side. Nobody knows what happens in that black box. Oracle actually confirmed this redirection in November of 2018. Also in 2018, the French paper Le Monde covered a hack of the African Union in which the AU cleaned out the bugs and stopped a server, believed to be a Huawei server, from sending out huge amounts of data every night at 2 a.m. to China. And just earlier this week, the BBC reported that Huawei removed Wi-Fi transmitting cards from the CCTV cabinets of a Pakistan-based surveillance system. They told the Pakistani authorities after they were found that the Wi-Fi cards would make it easier to troubleshoot problems without having to open up the cabinets. Then there's the global strategic risk. 
including the Chinese government exporting its model of authoritarianism right along with the digital infrastructure and equipment that it's selling. Smart city technologies, as I've mentioned, are becoming a critical element in China's commercial diplomacy. The Belt and Road Initiative provides a conduit for China to export smart city technology and an authoritarian governance model. Huawei is developing and exporting safe city, a safe city platforms, some of what they're calling smart cities, that utilize the Internet of Things technologies for a comprehensive public security system. A researcher at Science Po has noted that while safe city as a platform still has a limited international de deployment, the company has managed to re out, reach out to an increasingly large number of markets as the initial step before implementing large-scale smart city blueprints. The development of Huawei's safe city has evolved from the early stages where it was focused on the deployment of video surveillance to a more complex set of goals and technologies that aim at a public, complete and total public security management. Other Chinese companies, tech companies, are looking to export critical components of smart city infrastructure and may use this as a means to gather data on individuals in other countries. Smaller companies, like many of those involved in China's facial recognition boom, are also looking to expand as the market in China becomes saturated. The surveillance state that China is building could extend well beyond its sovereign territory. According to Sam Hoffman of the Australia Strategic, Public, uh, Strategic Policy Institute, China is also extending social credit and monitoring to overseas Chinese, and we know that they are monitoring overseas Uyghurs, including those here in the United States, and threatening harm to family back in Xinjiang if people speak out. Then there's concern about espionage. In a statement released on April 3rd, six retired U.S. senior military leaders noted a number of concerns about a China-developed 5G network. Among the concerns they raised were the ability of Chinese-designed 5G networks to provide near-persistent data transfer back to China. They note that China's 2017 national intelligence law legally requires that any organization or citizen shall support, assist, and cooperate with the Chinese security services. Their statement also identifies future military operations as possibly at risk as DOD considers how to harness the immense bandwidth and potential inherent in commercial 5G systems. Using Ch Chinese-developed networks to transfer military data is inherently risky and could endanger military operations in locations around the world. Networking of platforms means that what happens in one place can have an impact on others. It does matter to us if our allies and partners are using equipment that we believe is not safe from Chinese intrusion. One additional national security risk I would like to mention, specifically in relation to smart city development here in the US, is the possible use of the networks to sow confusion, seed misinformation, or disrupt normal activities in the event of a conflict, or merely to cause inconvenience and frustration. Dr. Harry mentioned this. Having access to, to information about transportation flows could allow someone to create traffic jams around military installations or major throughways. Information about railways could allow disruption of the movement of troops and equipment in the event of, a, event of a deployment. Information about the movement of hazardous waste through our cities could be used to our detriment. We know already that mapping of our utility grids has taken place. Matching that up with knowledge of peak usage times could cause massive disruption and chaos. So too with water. These are not pleasant scenarios to think about, and to, to some, they might sound paranoid. I've become accustomed to being the skunk at the garden party. We would be remiss in our responsibilities, however, if we were not thinking about worst case scenarios as digital, structure is, digital interest, infrastructure is being constructed. There are national security risks inherent in IoT supply chain vulnerabilities. The Commission's 2018 annual report to Congress and our contracted research paper on the I IoT noted that the rapid proliferation of IoT devices is outstripping industry standards. A 27 sur survey, 2017 survey of 593 mobile and IoT ap application developers and users found that vendors test only 20% of IoT applications for vulnerabilities. Of the ones that are tested, 
an average of 38% contain significant vulnerabilities. Few firms provide life cycle management for IoT devices, and computer, uh, consumers are often unaware of the need to install upgrades containing security patches when new vulnerabilities are unidentified. Universal connectivity of unsecured IoT devices could en enable remote exploitation to gather track location, to deny service, to eavesdrop or access information with authorization, to become part of a botnet, as, as uh, Dr. Harry mentioned, for a cyber attack, to modify firmware, hardware, or software without permission. And there are security vulnerabilities in the 5G supply chain, as the Huawei Cybersecurity Evaluation Center's own 2019 annual report, released in March, reveals serious security vulnerabilities exist in Huawei's products. The report indicated that Huawei had been asked to address some of these vulnerabilities in 2012 and failed, noting, quote, strongly worded commitments from Huawei in the past haven't brought about any discernible improvements. Importantly, the report expressed grave doubts about Huawei's ability to prioritize cybersecurity for more complex technologies like 5G. Clearly, China does not have to realize its complete vision on smart cities in order to have a drastic impact on how smart cities develop and are governed, but all is not yet lost. There are steps the US government can and should take now, including an assessment of supply chain risk, ensuring the rapid and secure development of a 5G network and enhanced export and investment review. Every year, the U.S.-China Commission makes a series of recommendations to Congress. Included in our 2018 recommendations were that Congress will require OMB's Federal Chief Information Security Officer Council to prepare an annual report to Congress to ensure supply chain vulnerabilities from China are adequately addressed. This report, we said, should collect and assess each agency's plans for supply chain risk management and assessments, existing departmental procurement and security policies and guidance on cybersecurity, operation security, physical security, information security, and data security that may affect information and communications technology, 5G networks, and Internet of Devices of Things, and areas where new policy and guidance may be needed, including for specific information and communications technology, 5G networks, IoT devices, applications or procedures, and where existing security policies and guidance can be updated to address supply chains, cyber operations, physical information, and data security vulnerabilities. It's a big job we're talking about. Um, and, it, and it really requires a whole of government response. Well, our other recommendation related to this topic is that Congress direct the National Telecommunications and Information Administration and Federal Communications Commission to identify steps to ensure the rapid and secure deployment of a 5G network with a per particular focus on the threat th posed by equipments and services designed or manufactured in China and whether any new statutory authorities are required to ensure the security of domestic 5G networks. And finally, I'd like to note the importance of engaged and vigorous participation by the US in international organiza organizations that govern the internet. The Chinese government is actively involved in pursuing leadership in organizations that set standards in this field and in other fields. ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, has a multi-stakeholder approach, including governments, corporations, and NGOs. The ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, is comprised solely of nations. Not surprisingly, the Chinese government supports and promotes the ITU as an internet manager. It also happens to be headed by a Chinese official who has, in the past, expressed disagreement with, cover, with, with current governance standards. A lot of topics came up. I'm not saying we shouldn't be moving forward on smart cities. Obviously, communities are. They have a lot to benefit by doing so. But we really need to be thinking about what that means in the bigger picture of, of protecting the, the people and the assets in this country. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today. And I really look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you.